To tell the story of Inception, we have to go back in time. Like that. After the release of Insomnia, Christopher was taken with the idea of conscious dreams. Every movie theater was showing movies about illusionary worlds, and still under the effect of The Matrix, The 13th Floor, and Dark City, he decided to write a story that took place in the kingdom of Morpheus. At first, he planned to shoot a horror film, and even pitched the concept to Warner Brothers. The studio thought it was complex, but liked the idea. Nolan began to write the script, but the process dragged on for seven years. He would return to the text between shooting, and waited for the opportune time. The main reason for the delay was not having enough experience with films of epic proportions. However, after the release of The Dark Knight, Chris became more confident and finally landed on an appropriate genre. Horror was replaced with adventure thriller, where multi-layered dreams were likened to the stages of robbing a bank. One would think that after the smashing success of the previous movie, Warner would agree to any project of Nolan's, but the executives were deterred by the complexity of the narrative and lack of literary base. The director had only written his debut film by himself. The rest, he had based on comics, stories, and novels. Also, when writing the script for Inception, he didn't utilize any scientific research about dreams, just his personal experience. A lot of what I find you want to do with research is just confirming things things you want to do. If the research contradicts what you want to do, you tend to go ahead and do it anyway. So at a certain point, I realized that if you're trying to reach an audience, being as subjective as possible and really trying to write from something genuine is the way to go. In order to convince the studio to back the project, Nolan demonstrated how one could easily understand the layers. The first was rain, the second, night at the hotel, and the third, the snowy mountain range. But Warner gave Inception the green light only after Christopher promised to make a third installment of Batman. Also, Nolan convinced Leonardo DiCaprio to join the project, whose name guaranteed commercial success. It is possible. Leo was Christopher's only candidate for the lead role. He never imagined anyone else as playing Dom Cobb. The director had already communicated with DiCaprio about participating in his other projects, but just couldn't seem to find the right fit. This time, DiCaprio was inspired by the premise, which reminded him of Memento and Insomnia, but on steroids. Hey guys, hey. How are you, how you doing, huh? The actor plunged into the preparation, and even convinced Nolan to change the structure of the narrative. You, you asked me for Inception. I do hope you understand the, the gravity of that request. Leonardo and Christopher spent two months rewriting and enhancing the screenplay. You're not gonna wake up, remember? You're gonna die, now just, just step back inside, come on. But DiCaprio wasn't the only one Nolan had envisioned in a role. The director had dreamed of working with Ken Watanabe, again after his cameo in Batman Begins. Impressive. The actor's charisma amazed him, so Chris wrote a role specifically for him. Do you want to take a leap of faith? Or become an old man filled with regret? As for Michael Caine, he took part in the fourth of Christopher's films in a row. So you, you want me to let someone else follow you into your fantasy. It so happens that Kane accidentally gave away the main spoiler of the movie. During an interview with BBC Radio 1, Michael was saying how he couldn't tell the difference himself between the dream and reality sequences, and asked the director to help him. Chris answered him in one sentence. Well, when you're in the scene, it's reality. Another longtime friend for whom Christopher reserved a role was Killian Murphy. This is a dream. I should just kill myself to wake up. Right. Later, luck favored Nolan in his search for fresh faces. Pleased to meet you. Ellen Page was admitted to the project without an audition. The director explained the premise to the actress, and when he saw her keen interest, realized that he had found what he was looking for. Mind telling your subconscious to take it easy? It's my subconscious. Remember, I can't control it. Dilip Rao and Tom Berenger also happily joined the project. Uh, those bastards have had at me for two days. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, on the other hand, was a second choice. 
Chris chose him after James Franco turned down his offer and decided to do Danny Boyle's 127 hours. That's for sure! Nolan chose Tom Hardy because of his part in Rock and Rolla, though the actor thought that it was because of his part in the drama, Bronson. My name's Charles Bronson. And all my life I've wanted to be famous. It was only during shooting that he realized that Chris had never even seen Winding Refn's film. Oh, great. Thank you. Nolan also convinced Marion Cotillard to join the cast and her role eventually made it into the cinematographer's list of the top femme fatale. I don't believe in one reality anymore. So choose. Choose to be here. Choose me. There was, of course, one more new face. Christopher's son, Magnus, made his debut in this film. Nolan got the cast together and while the decorations were being prepared, explained to the actors the thousands of symbolic references in the screenplay, present even in the names of the characters. The hero is Dom Cobb. The name Dom was borrowed from the Russian word for home and reveals the protagonist's desire to return there. When are you coming home, Dad? How would you like to go home? I don't know how much you want to go home. I think I found a way home. I need to get home. That's all I care about right now. And I've got to get back home. You need the simplest version of the idea in order for it to grow naturally in your subject's mind. That's a very subtle art. Are you all right, Mr. Cobb? Cobb is the last name of a famous American architect who designed skyscrapers. That is why Dom's limbo is filled with them. You built all this? This is incredible. We built for years. Cobb was also the main character in Christopher's first full-length film. My name's Cobb. Mal means bad, or unlucky in both Spanish and French, and clearly identifies her role in the story. The death was the only escape. Robert Fisher is a nod to world chess champion Bobby Fisher, and Maurice Fisher is an allusion to the artist Moritz Escher, whose drawings inspired the visual effects of the film. See? Paradox. Ellen Page's character is named Ariadne. According to Greek mythology, she was the daughter of Minas, who helped Theseus escape the labyrinth of the Minotaur. The film character does the exact same thing. As soon as the music ends, you blow up the hospital, and we all ride the kick back up the layers. But Nolan didn't stop there. The first letters of the characters' names spell out the message of the story. Dreams pay. Additionally, each member of the Inception team is a metaphor for roles in the movie industry. Cobb is the director, Arthur, the producer, Ariadne, the production designer, Eames, the actor, Sato, the studio, Yusuf, the technician, and Robert Fisher, the audience. Pay attention to the strangeness of the weather, the shift in gravity. None of this is real. In trying to write a team-based creative process, I wrote the one I know, Cobb. It's rare that you can identify yourself so clearly in a film. This film is very clear for me. It's the chance to build cathedrals, entire cities, things that never existed, things that couldn't exist in the real world. Another sly detail in the story is Edith Piaf's song. It doesn't only play upon waking up. Hans Zimmer explains that the whole soundtrack is based on pieces from the composition which have been slowed down or sped up. Basically, the audience is listening to the same music the whole movie, which naturally weaves in with the dreams. All the music in the score is subdivisions and multiplications of the tempo of Edith Piaf's track. I was surprised how long it took them to figure it out. It wasn't supposed to be a secret. Even the timing of the whole film is an homage of sorts to Non, je ne regrette rien. The original track which Hans Zimmer found in the governmental archives of France is 2 minutes and 28 seconds long. The cinema version of Inception is 2 hours and 28 minutes long. And after the credits finish rolling, the song starts again. In doing this, the director added another level of film industry metaphors and compared the end of the movie with a dream from which the viewer eventually has to wake up. I am impressed. Your condescension, as always, is much appreciated, Arthur. Thank you. Nolan not only found his inspiration in music, but in film also. He repeatedly called the movie On Your Majesty's Secret Service 
the best of the James Bond franchise. This movie about Agent 007 inspired him to add in a winter scene. Christopher was also enchanted by the perfect balance of action, romance, and drama in that Bond installment, and he tried to replicate it in his own movie. Now, before you bother telling me it's impossible... It's no, it's perfectly possible. It's just bloody difficult. Another source of innovation were the Japanese anime Akira and Paprika, from which Nolan extensively borrowed imagery. Feel that? In the middle of July 2009, Chris traveled to Tokyo, where he began shooting. After a few scenes in Japan, the team relocated to Great Britain, where they built sets which baffled the imagination. Listen, if you're going to perform Inception, you need imagination. Again, Christopher chose to bring his fantasy to life without graphics. Now, let's just do this in post, and we all knew that we couldn't. It just had to be done properly in order for it to be a believable thing. Though in a film where reality itself is in question, graphics couldn't be avoided. In most cases, the CGI only enhanced the special effects, but did not replace them. He favored creativity over green screens, and one of the most impressive feats was the rotating corridor. The technology was inherited directly from Space Odyssey. And I like the idea of repurposing that technology and really trying to, to choreograph an entire fight sequence. And Joseph Gordon-Levitt, along with a team of stuntmen, spent two weeks in it. It was like some incredible torture device. We thrashed Joseph for weeks, but in the end, we looked at the footage and it looks unlike anything any of us had seen before. The rhythm of it is unique. And when you watch it, even if you know how it is done, it confuses your perception. However, it was the combination with CGI which made this scene so spectacular. There were hundreds of cables and suspended objects which were imitating zero gravity. This was the result of Nolan's vision regarding the marriage of special effects and computer graphics. Trains on the road, waves on the streets, Escher's actual staircase, and the explosion in the square. The only scenes which were completely computer generated were the ones in Limbo and the scene by the bridge. The Infinity Mirror refers to Nolan's earlier works, Doodlebug, and the Memento poster. The chase and fall from the bridge were filmed over four months in Los Angeles, and actors falling in slow-mo spent a whole day in the minivan. The film crew faced its final hurdle in Canada, where they built the set of the fortress. But November of 2009 turned out to be abnormally warm, and two days before the arrival of the actors, Christopher's location manager sent him photos of a set covered in dirt instead of snow. About a week before we went to Canada, there was no snow. The whole thing was built around snow, and so we were very, very tense. Luckily, a day later, Alberta got the worst snowstorm it had seen in decades. Thanks to several similar strokes of luck, Nolan was able to finish filming early and save 10% of the budget. Is it possible? Of course not. In the editing stage, representatives of Warner Brothers tried to talk Nolan into making the movie in 3D. However, the director feared that the effect would distract from the story itself, and instead of seeing the illusions on the screen, the audience would see only the illusions of depth 
so he convinced the studio to scrap the idea. Don't do that! Don't do that! Chris and Lee Smith edited the film over the next seven months. The duo was able to combine multi-layered dreams, action, and drama into one uninterrupted sequence, which pulls the viewer in and keeps him there from the first seconds. This was when a broad promotion campaign was launched. The studio invested $100 million in advertising the film, and it paid off when Inception's profits exceeded $800 million. The stronger the issues, the more powerful the catharsis. This result not only flattered Christopher and Leonardo's egos, but it also lined their wallets. Before shooting, they stipulated in their contract that they wanted a percentage of the profit, rather than a fixed sum. Money, not just money. Despite the financial success, once again, Christopher was not able to win Hollywood's most important prize. Inception was nominated for eight statuettes and won half of them. Oscar goes to Wally Pfister for Inception. It was the fifth film together with Wally Pfister and this fourth nomination which finally won him an Oscar for Best Cinematography. Ah, uh, I'll take a breath here for a minute. Breathe it in for a second. This is, hey, you. <laughs> Since Chris once again refused to switch filming crews, each scene in the movie was a direct result of Pfister's work. None of what I w did was, would have been possible without the incredible vision of my master, Christopher Nolan. His work... Not only was Wally victorious, but so was the sound editing, sound mixing, and the visual effects team. Um, uh, it feels like that top is still spinning, but... I don't really care anymore. Unfortunately, the finale of the evening didn't meet expectations. The Social Network won Best Soundtrack, Alice in Wonderland won Best Production Design, and Nolan didn't win the Best Original Screenplay category for the second time in his career. King's Speech, David Sodden. The victor of that evening was The King's Speech, which even beat Inception in the Best Picture nomination. The King's Speech! Yeah. Not to mention, Nolan was not even nominated for Best Director, and not a single actor from the ensemble was nominated either. <laughs> the public felt differently, however. The movie is being talked about to this day, and it appears in many of the top 10 greatest movies of all time lists. Christopher wasn't too bothered by the loss, since he was used to being underestimated by the Academy. Instead of feeling sorry for himself, he got to work on a new project. I'm done. I'm sorry. Hey! Do you like our work? Let us know with your like and comment. Push that subscribe button and share with your friends. If you want to support the project financially, become our sponsor on Patreon or YouTube sponsorship. Thank you.